I'm Stash Butler for Taiwan Plus, and today I'm in downtown Taipei, where Lithuania has just opened its long-awaited Taiwan trade office. Mending the legacy, Taiwan's lawmakers call for the National Palace Museum to reform its artifact handling protocol. U.S. midterm elections. Experts predict Republicans to take the House and the Senate. How will it affect Taiwan? More and more Taiwanese elderly are living alone, and it's becoming an election issue. A warm welcome to Taiwan Plus News. I'm Leslie Liao. Lithuania has officially opened its trade office in Taiwan. It's the latest step in a two-year-long journey towards closer ties. Stash Butler has the story. I'm standing here in downtown Taipei, where Lithuania has just opened its brand new trade office. And it's been a long time coming. For many years, Lithuania and Taiwan had no representation in each other's countries. Then, last year, Lithuania dropped out of a Chinese trade initiative in Europe and signed a historic deal with Taiwan to open two representative offices, one in Taipei and one in Vilnius. Representative offices are essentially a kind of unofficial embassy. And what was special for Taiwan is that Lithuania let it use the word Taiwanese in the name of the office. Usually they're called something like the Taipei representative office to avoid suggesting that Taiwan is a country. China reacted furiously to the agreement. It blocked almost all imports from Lithuania downgraded ties, and then began blocking some trade with companies that use Lithuanian parts, like German cars. But the deal stuck. Taiwan opened its office in Vilnius last year, and now Lithuania has opened one in Taipei. Taiwan's foreign ministry has welcomed the news. Lithuanian Trade Representative Office. Tamzatsuotienzatwaiji at the event announcing the opening of the office, Taiwan said it would invest three and a half million US dollars in a Lithuanian tech company. That's just a tiny part of a $200 million fund and a billion dollars of credit that Taiwan has promised for Lithuanian businesses. And that brings us to where we are now, a new ally in Europe for Taiwan and a new friend in Asia for Lithuania. Leon Lien and Stash Butler in Taipei for Taiwan Plus. St. Kitts and Nevis Prime Minister Terence Drew is leading a delegation to Taiwan for a four-day trip. His country is one of Taiwan's few remaining diplomatic allies, and he was welcomed with military honors in Taipei. Bing Wang was there. Now it's pouring outside, so we've been moved inside, but Taiwan is still pulling all its stops for Prime Minister Terence Drew of St. Kitts and Nevis. Now it's his first time being here in Taiwan since being sworn in in August of 2022. The two countries have always enjoyed good relations. In fact, St. Kitts and Nevis is one of 14 diplomatic allies of Taiwan. The ceremony was attended by top Taiwanese officials and a delegation from St. Kitts and Nevis. Taiwan welcomed the Prime Minister with a military salute. Taiwan's President Tsai Ing-wen presided over the ceremony and hopes to deepen ties with the Caribbean country. We hope that through this dialogue, the St. Kitts and Nevis Prime Minister plans to build on bilateral cooperation with Taiwan. As true friends, the government of St. Kitts and Nevis is always ready to use its influence in international fora to advocate for values and principles which we share with the Republic of China, Taiwan. The delegation will meet with other top Taiwanese officials on a four-day trip to work on bilateral projects. Taiwan is hoping to build on its diplomatic relations with St. Kitts and Nevis, hoping the country will help Taiwan speak out in international forums that Taiwan is barred from. 
Howard Zhang and Bing Wong in Taipei for Taiwan Plus. Taiwan's lawmakers are urging the country's National Palace Museum to review its artifact handling protocols. This comes after legislators revealed that the museum had mishandled and broken at least four artifacts in the past 10 years. Footage shows a museum worker accidentally breaking a priceless artifact. This is at Taiwan's National Palace Museum, which houses one of the world's largest collections of Chinese treasures. Lawmakers acquired this footage after it came to light that four rare antiques had been damaged at the museum in the past decade. Three of those were damaged in the past two years. Following this, legislators began a thorough examination of the museum's records. They soon found that more items had been damaged. Now, these lawmakers are calling for a review and an overhaul of procedures at the museum. Following the backlash, the museum director admitted that its artifact storage, packaging and maintenance practices were not up to standard. Recent findings show that previous cases where artifacts were damaged have been poorly recorded and few disciplinary actions were taken. The museum says it will carry out a thorough review and re-evaluation of its procedures. And Taiwan's government oversight body is also dispatching investigators to carry out an examination of its own. Alex Chen and Leslie Liao for Taiwan Plus. Taiwanese badminton star Zhou Tianchen claims he lost out on a men's singles title due to a bad call. Zhou is uh, not satisfied with that call. Zhou was competing in the final round of the Hilo Open in Germany when he lost to Indonesian counterpart Anthony Ginting. Though he had trailed 16 to 20 at one stage, Zhou saved six match points to tie the game at 22. But during the next rally, the umpire ruled a fault on one of Zhou's returns. He ultimately, he ultimately went on to lose the match and title. The organizer has upheld the decision. Hundreds of aircraft of all shapes and sizes are in China for the country's largest air show. Taking place in the city of Zhuhai, the air show is a chance for Beijing to showcase its military might. But for countries like Taiwan, it's also an opportunity to gain some insight into China's defensive capabilities. Jaime Okan explains. In recent weeks, this auditorium in central China has been home to some of the country's most advanced military hardware. The weaponry on display includes new types of drones, missiles, and next-generation aircraft. This is the Zhuhai Air Show, China's largest military exhibition. Chinese officials claim that it's a testament to the modernization of its armed forces. One of the main features of the air show has been this plane, the J-20. Some defense experts believe the Chinese jet could possibly rival some of the United States' most elite fighters. Uh, you can consider the uh, Gen 20, Gen R10, J20, as China's equivalent to America's F-22. So it is China's most advanced steel fighter that's currently in service. So the stealth fighters are in Zhuhai is meant to showcase China's military might they are to, uh, in my view, to boost image of the Chinese military. The weapons China has been showcasing will not have gone unnoticed in Taiwan. China, which claims Taiwan as part of its territory, has not ruled out using force against the island nation. Were an attack to be carried out, it's likely that the sort of weaponry on display here would be used by the Chinese military. So, so, uh, this is... Uh, uh, 
，当然是觉得啊、呃，这个是要。这一种会，但是可以关心一下。In response to increased Chinese military pressure, Taiwan has also been bolstering its defensive capabilities. Analysts say air shows such as this could provide Taiwan's defense sector with valuable insights. This air show also offers us a window to see the possible future trends, like where the Chinese military is eventually going in the near future. This time, uh. A new missile, a new air air launched ground attack cruise missile, is showcased for the first time, and we haven't seen it before. The expo will last five days in total, and while the hardware on display may look imposing, none of these Chinese weapons have ever been tested in combat. Andy Shui and Jaime Ocon for Taiwan Plus. U.S. voters are heading to the polls on Tuesday, and on the ballot, thousands of seats at the local, state, and national level. Hot button issues include inflation, rising gas prices, and abortion. And believe it or not, some politicians are even talking about Taiwan. Bing Wang reports. The question again goes to both of you: Should America defend Taiwan? I believe that we should. This is,、uh, you know, we have a commitment.、It's、the reason why Taiwan is different is because they make so many of our semiconductors, our computer chips. The entire modern economy would collapse without it. A rare moment in a heated debate, two opposing candidates for Senate in the U.S. state of Ohio find common ground. Four years ago, candidates in Ohio were not even talking about Taiwan, but China's increased military aggression has pushed Taiwan to the fore. Even President Joe Biden has voiced support for Taiwan. So, unlike Ukraine, to be clear, sir, U.S. forces, U.S. men and women, would defend Taiwan. In the event of a Chinese invasion, yes. Foreign policy expert Jia Qinxi says that for both parties, there's good reason why they want to focus on China and Taiwan rather than on domestic politics. When the economy is going bad, it is very likely for、um, both parties to play what we call diversionary tactics because they cannot solve the、uh, issues at home immediately. That's why they would. Find a way to divert the attention of the ordinary people to、uh, threats outside the U.S. Both Republicans and Democrats appear to agree about Taiwan and China, but she says they are vying to prove which party has a tougher stance. I would say、um, both parties would see that、uh, playing up China threat is a relatively effective. And also cheap method for them to gain more scores、uh, on foreign policy issues. No politician would want to lose、um, on Taiwan issues.、Uh, so I think、uh, the Taiwan card is going to be played more and more. President Joe Biden is not on the ballot this year. He has two more years in office. The main prize for the two parties is the House of Representatives and the Senate. The president's Democratic Party currently holds both chambers of Congress, but polls show that the Republicans are likely to win majorities on Tuesday. That will make it difficult for Biden to make legislation. But Taiwan Studies expert James Lin says that if Republicans win both chambers, we might see Biden take a harder stance on China. Just because Republicans typically have that position, and Biden might be able to.、Um, You know, score some points from the broader kind of、uh, electorate. We will have to wait and see until all the votes are counted to see which party controls Congress. But no matter who wins, one thing is clear: the issue of Taiwan and China is here to stay. As Naya Zhou and Bing Wang for Taiwan Plus. And now for some news that slam dunks. American basketball star Dwight Howard is coming to play in Taiwan. This is the White Howard, A.K.A. Superman, and I am so so excited, and I can't wait to touch down in Taiwan and start playing for the Taiwan City Leopards. This is my third time in Taiwan. I haven't been in so long. I can't wait to see the fans, eat the food, and have the best time ever, and bring a championship to Taiwan City. Let's go! The NBA veteran was the first overall draft pick in 2004, and has played for several teams. Most recently, the LA Lakers. He won the 2020 championship with them and has been named a league All-Star eight times. But the Lakers did not re-sign him after the 2021 season. 
Howard will play his first game with the Taoyuan Leopards on November 19th. In the final weeks of Taipei's mayoral race, candidates are turning to a hot-button issue, how to power the city. It's all part of a larger debate over a looming power crunch facing Taiwan. John Van Trieste reports. This ultra-high voltage substation near Taipei is getting electricity where it's needed. But while this station is fully functional, the construction of more like it has been delayed. The levels of electricity that can reach Taipei have become a major concern for many city residents. And in the lead-up to Taipei's mayoral election, this issue has become political. However, not all agree that the capital city does have enough electricity. On the campaign trail, independent candidate Vivian Huang made her thoughts on the matter clear. Some analysts agree that Taipei could be facing a power shortage. But the number of electrical substations is not the only pressing electrical issue. Taiwan is currently attempting to reduce its reliance on nuclear power, and finding alternative power sources may take time. The result will be a nationwide power crunch. This could hit northern cities like Taipei especially hard. So the reason for that is that the uh, LNG terminal uh, in Taoyuan area, the project has been delayed. Uh, it will not be completed uh, until 2025. And I just said that the uh, another unit at Gosa Nuclear Power Plant will be shut down next March. So between next March and 2025, that's the most serious electricity shortage period uh, for the entire Taiwan, especially for the northern part of Taiwan. It's only two weeks out from the local elections where Taipei will choose its next mayor, and it's clear that whomever voters pick for the top job will be charged with powering the city well beyond this election season. Damon Lin and John Van Trieste for Taiwan Plus. Taiwan's exports have fallen for a second consecutive month. That's according to trade data released Tuesday by the finance ministry. Exports in October fell 0.5 percent compared to the same period last year. The figure beat economists' forecasts, which predicted a larger drop, but is still an unwelcome drop for Taiwan. Exports are an important driver of the country's economic growth. The numbers indicate fewer sales to China and Hong Kong were partly responsible for the fall. And in China, too, the latest trade figures are painting a gloomy economic picture. Chinese exports contracted in October for the first time since the start of the pandemic. The 0.3 percent drop was worse than forecasts, which predicted exports would grow, and comes as Beijing doubles down on its stringent zero-COVID approach. On Monday, China recorded its highest number of daily COVID cases in six months. To find out more about gloomy trade figures across the region, our reporter James Chater spoke with Nick Morrow, lead analyst for global trade at the Economist Intelligence Unit based in Hong Kong. What's behind this negative trade picture for Taiwan at the moment, and could it drag on Taiwan's overall economic growth? Well, if you think about where things stood around this time last year, um, there were a number of really positive things that were boosting Taiwanese exports. So we were right in the throes of the global chip shortage, there was still really strong international demand for consumer electronics, and that all really played to Taiwan's strength. But right now, when we consider the demand factors internationally, things are in a much more dire situation. Um, we're seeing a slowdown in consumer demand in the US and the EU, and we're seeing a very sharp slowdown in import demand in China specifically, because trade is such an important part of the Taiwanese economy. Um, and given that there might be trickle-down impacts on things like you know, employment, wages, household incomes, that's going to keep things relatively tight uh, in terms of economic pressure heading into next year. China's also just posted some of its weakest trade statistics since the pandemic began. Do you think that picture is going to give the Chinese leadership pause for thought on its own COVID zero approach? In short, probably not. Um, the zero COVID policy in China is incredibly political. Uh, what we saw coming out of the party congress meetings was sustained attachment to that policy. Um, if we are going to see any movement away, it's probably going to be very gradual. 
Chinese exports dropping off is a sign that demand in the US and the EU and other key export destinations is faltering. And that has implications for Taiwanese exporters because Taiwanese exporters often send to China the intermediate components that then go into the finished products, which are then re-exported. And so I think we can sum up by saying, as long as the Chinese economy remains under stress, a lot of that stress is going to naturally spill over to Taiwan as well. We've seen weak export data across Asia in the last couple of weeks, first in South Korea, in China, and now in Taiwan as well. What does all of this tell us about the prospects for the global economy in the coming months? Well, we're expecting the global economy to enter 2023 in a pretty fragile state. The US and the EU are likely going to post uh, ranging from kind of milder to more severe recessions. Um, and that's, that's bad for Asia. Asia is very, very dependent on export growth. But overall, we are expecting Asia's export boom to end. And that's a big deal because it was Asia's export boom that really allowed the region to navigate through the pandemic. And so heading to 2023, there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of potential pain um, heading our way. Taiwan's aging population and declining birth rates are increasing concerns. It's forecast that by 2025, 20% of Taiwan's population will be aged 65 and over. This could lead to a shrinking workforce and put major strains on public services, such as health care. Recently, the number of senior citizens living alone has also reached record highs. Louise Watt reports. Miss Song is 93 years old. One of her hobbies is to sing at the local community center. She lives by herself, but comes here most days to see friends and take part in different activities. Miss Song's living situation is far from uncommon. The number of Taiwan's senior citizens who live on their own has soared in recent years. Many choose to live in special communities for the 65s and over, where units are rented on a monthly basis. Taiwan's population is getting older. Of the country's 23 million people, just under 4 million or 17 percent are aged 65 or over. This year, the number of households made up of only senior citizens surpassed 680,000 for the first time ever. Of them, more than 500,000 live alone. Many are financially independent, with the freedom to live in their own homes or retirement communities. But some observers say the government needs to provide more for older people who aren't homeowners. Huang is among an increasing number of people pressuring the government to take urgent action. Taiwan's aging population risks putting strain on welfare and healthcare systems and the economy. Finding accommodation for a growing number of seniors is just one of many issues that will demand attention in years to come. Ricky and Louise Watt for Taiwan Plus. Taiwan's increasing number of senior citizens has also become an issue in the run-up to this month's local elections. Louise Watt looks at the southern city of Tainan where the mayoral candidates have made catering for the city's elderly one of the focal points of their campaigns. For some cities in Taiwan, the realities of an aging population are already apparent. In the southern city of Tainan, more than 37,000 senior citizens live alone. The number of households with elderly residents are growing at a faster rate here than in any of Taiwan's other cities. The issue is now appearing on the political radar. Candidates vying to be the city's next mayor have been focusing their campaigns on appealing to the elderly. Xie Liongjie is running for Taiwan's main opposition party, the Kuomintang. He's advocating for the government to pay national health insurance costs for seniors. Xie says Tainan's public finances can afford it. 
，只要提无到四趴、三趴外，老人健保、囡仔营养午餐、生囝补助，这拢总有啊。哦，一千亿，你要提这三十外亿出来开，真简单。But CS challenger, current mayor Huang Weizhi, says money isn't the issue. 对手就只是想说发一发钱啊就了事，我觉得其实这不是一个正办，而且年长者的需要的是照顾以及实际上体贴的政策，发一发钱是简最简单，但是最廉价，而且是最不尊敬老长者的做法。Huang is running for re-election under Taiwan's ruling Democratic Progressive Party, which has dominated Tainan for 25 years. He says they've rolled out smaller buses for older citizens and are building social housing for them. However, the opposition believes Tainan also needs to focus on keeping young people in the city. The elderly are on the agenda for this election, but for the problem of Tainan's and Taiwan's aging population, there's no easy solution in sight. Howard Zhang and Louise Watt for Taiwan Plus. A Taiwanese high school marching band is set to perform in the Rose Parade in Los Angeles next year. It will be the first performance by a band from Taipei First Girls High School at the annual parade in 18 years. A total of 135 students and teachers will travel to California to take part. Thank you for watching Taiwan Plus News. Finally today, we leave you with images of the beauty of a Midwest fall in the United States. I'm Leslie Liao, take care and see you next time.